harrowing, terrible stories emerged from the months-long do-or-die battle for Stalingrad between Soviet troops and Nazi Germany in World War II. But according to author Ian Garner, as awful as some of those stories were, they became indispensable narratives for a certain kind of Russian nationalism. He brings that history to light in his new book. It's called Stalingrad Lives, Stories of Combat and Survival. And Ian Garner joins us now on how that past continues to inform generations of Russians. Ian, welcome. Great to have you here. Hi, thank you for having me. One of the great ironies of the title of your book, Stalingrad Lives, is that Stalingrad is no more. Do you want to tell us what's happened to the name of that city? Well, of course, it is a name with a vexed history. Mm. Stalingrad, literally, Stalin city, ville, Kingston, town, mm. Stalingrad became briefly Volgograd, of course, and in that time, the idea of the Battle of Stalingrad disappeared completely in the 1960s. But since the 90s, when Russian nationalism has become increasingly resurgent, the idea of Stalingrad has become resurrected. It's become emblematic of a story of Russian utopia, Russian sacrifice, and Russian success. And we're seeing its importance today, of course, in stories about Ukraine. But it's still called Volgograd today. Well, it is. Except if you go on holidays, when for some days every year, including, of course, Victory Day, the 9th of May, the town once again becomes Stalingrad. Hmm. Okay. Can I tell you a weird little story here? Of course I can. Course. You're my guest here, so sorry, you're going to have to listen to this. Before I cracked the cover on the book, I saw the title, and I thought to myself, Stalingrad lives. Okay, it, it lives, it endures. But I also thought it could be read Stalingrad lives as in you're about to tell me the story of the lives of people who survived that horror uh, all those years ago. Um, which is it? Well, I'm glad you spotted it, that it is absolutely both. In one sense, this rallying cry, Stalingrad lives, that we heard both during the battle in 1942, when it really looked like the city was on the brink of collapse and all that stood between the Wehrmacht Hitler's armies and their allied armies, of course, and what looked potentially like victory in the war was Stalingrad. And Stalingrad clung by a thread. The Soviets sent more and more troops into battle, and every day for several months, all Soviet readers of the newspapers, Soviet radio listeners heard was that Stalingrad is about to collapse, yet miraculously. And really, this is a religious idea, a miracle. Stalingrad continues to live. And yet, on the other hand, Stalingrad has perpetually had this afterlife. It's been something that Russians, patriotic Russians, nationalist Russians, and many Russians who are, let's say, much more ordinary figures and might not identify as extreme nationalists or patriots, have built their lives around. They identify with this as an important element of their identity. And thus was born a myth of Stalingrad, which continues to inform Russia today. What's that myth? Well, the story in a nutshell is, and this was produced, as I talk, talk about in the book in some depth, at the front, in the trenches, the story goes that a million people, a million Soviet soldiers at Stalingrad died in order to save the world. The city itself symbolically died in order to save the world. There is this messianic idea of sacrifice, and you'll start to hear, see here this almost Christian idea of sacrifice. It's not a regrettable sacrifice that a million people died. We wish we didn't have to do that, that there was some other way. The idea is much like the story of Jesus in Christian legend or Christian myth. These people had to die. They had to be martyred to save the city, to bring the country and bring the world back to life. And stop fashion, stop Nazism. Exactly. Hmm. How different was that myth, as you've just described it, from the reality of what transpired 80 years ago? Well, in many ways, it's striking that much of what occurred at Stalingrad was well reflected by Soviet writers at the time. And in the book, I delve into how the Soviet Union sent its finest novelists, men like Vasily Grossman, the famous author of Life and Fate, to the front. And they actually documented what was happening pretty accurately, recorded their thoughts and feelings for Soviet readers as they felt the city was on the brink of collapse, as they felt the city was dying. And yet somehow the Soviets pulled a miracle out of the bag, 
won the battle with quite an astonishing counterattack in November 1942. And these people felt that this miracle really had taken place, that somehow they'd gone from staring defeat in the eye to believing that a march to Berlin and victory in the war was possible. If there's one thing I suspect people have heard as it relates to this battle 80 years ago, 80 years plus ago, it's that as, as Russians retreated at some point, other Russian soldiers shot them uh, to, to, to you know, scare them into turning around and continuing to face the Germans. You tell us in this book that kind of thing didn't really happen very much at all. Is that right? Well, the sad reality is, to a certain extent, it did happen. Something like 10,000 Soviet soldiers were executed by their own sides at and around Stalingrad. And this is a huge battle. It's not just restricted to this small city. It's taking place on a front that is hundreds of kilometers long. And the reality, of course, is 10,000 executions is awful. It's unspeakable, it's horrific, but by Soviet standards and by the standards of a battle where a million people died in six months, this is almost vanishingly insignificant when we look at it on this numerical scale, at least. Instead, what we see is a real surge of patriotism and enthusiasm from really the beginning of the war and then centered around Stalingrad, this do or die moment. And Soviets were keen to go to the front. They were asking to go to the front. They wanted to go to Stalingrad. They wanted to defend their land because they believed. As Russians today believe of Ukraine, that by fighting this war, they are avoiding the possibility of total obliteration at the hands of a genocidal army. Russians believe that, or the head of Russia believes that? Well, today, many Russians do believe it. Of course, the head of, the head of Russia, Putin, does very much believe it. And it is surprising to me, as I've conducted research for my follow-up book, that a number of Russians, a large number of Russians, probably 20 to 30% of the population today do buy a much more extreme narrative and do believe that Russia is under an existential threat coming from the West and embodied in Ukraine. What is the difference then between how Western interpretations of Stalingrad from 80 years ago sit today compared to Russian versions of what Stalingrad now stands for? Well, I would say that the Western story of Stalingrad is all about the cold, the suffering, the inhumanity, the futility of war, and we probably all have that image of freezing soldiers in the trenches in the city at the top of our mind. Maybe people might remember Enemy at the Gates, the Jude Law movie from, was it the late 90s, early 2000s? Fabulous I don't movie. Remember. It's a fun movie. Fun right? movie? Well, fun in the Hollywood sense, but of course it's, it's a sad movie. Yeah. But for Russians, this is a story that brings something like warm feelings to the surface. Feelings of pride, feelings that it's Russia that's owed something by the world for having made this sacrifice on behalf of the rest of humanity. Russians, at least, who follow this narrative, and I would say that's the majority of the population when it comes to this myth of World War II, will tell you that Americans, Westerners, don't understand us. Is that a fair point? I think it is unfortunate that in the, in the West, we don't pay much attention to what happened on the Eastern Front. Historically, you know, our war movies are all about D-Day. We rarely mention the Eastern Front. We rarely mention the size of the sacrifices on the Eastern Front. And yet, at the same time, what's missing from the Russian story, of course, is the fact that at the same time as Stalingrad was happening, there was fighting in North Africa that was distracting the Axis forces that was actually helping the Russians. America and Britain were providing money lend-lease, arms and equipment to Russia to keep that fight going. Allies who don't understand each other very much even all these years later. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's, uh, we're going to do something kind of quirky here. We're going to play a little bit of a clip. This is the Red Army Choir, and they are singing The Sacred War. That is a marching song written just after the German attack on the Soviet Union in 1941. And this song takes place over images of that time. Shall we? Perfect. If you would, the clip, please. <laughs>
Hmm. Do you have a sense of what Russians today think when they see and hear that? I would say Russians have a sense of deep nostalgia and pride. In the West, we have this phrase around the war, never again. We don't want a repeat of this. We don't see that sense of pride. We regret the fact that it ever happened. For, but for patriotic Russians, the phrase is, Mojim povdarit, we can do this again. And that's what's coming through in the present, the idea that war today in Ukraine reiterates this march to the front, this glorious sense of, and it's funny that the name of that song, Sacred War. This is something sacred, it's something quasi-religious, it defines us. It may not reflect the reality of the past entirely, but it reflects a mythical time when Russia was strong, when Russia was doing great things for the world, and Russia was somehow fulfilling a historical messianic mission. Здравствуйте. Привет. Как дела? Очень хорошо. Okay, I'm just making the point that uh, even though you've got an English accent, you've lived in Russia, your Russian is very good. How come? I was always fascinated when I first started learning Russian many years ago by the idea that Russia is on the brink of Europe. Moscow and Petersburg, these people look European, they feel European, and of course, when I was getting involved in this game in the early 2000s, it was a time when Russia seemed to be edging its way towards Europe. And yet these mindsets still persisted. The pride and the war, the differences, the rejection of so many things that are European, and of course what we've seen in the past 20 years is that the scales have tipped very much in favor of rejection of the Western European and anything that can be labeled as Western. And isn't that fascinating that this culture could be so similar to our own and yet so utterly reject us violently, aggressively, as they're doing today? Let me pick up on that. Here's an um, excerpt from your book. Putin's pilgrimages to Volgograd, you write, tap into a rich vein of emotion that courses with hope, religiosity, and the sense of a unifying national epic. By invoking the text of Stalingrad, a novel by Vasily Grossman, in his 2018 speech, Putin was encouraging listeners to reflect on the nature and interrelation of personal and national pasts so as to prompt them to conclude that the new can emerge from even the most hopeless situations, even from death itself. What kind of connections do you see? I know you touched on this, but let's go here again. The myths of Stalingrad and the brutality, frankly, of Russia's attack on Ukraine. Well, here we see the idea that as Putin promises by refighting the Second World War. Supposedly today, the war in Ukraine is a war against Nazi invaders, fascists who are committing a genocide against what Putin terms ethnic Russians in the east of Ukraine. And Russians once again have been called on to fulfill their historic duty to save the world, save themselves from this threat. It's all you know, completely detached from reality. But the promise is, by fighting and by dying, the culture, Russia can somehow be spiritually renewed, reinvigorated, as happened in that miraculous turnaround at Stalingrad again. And I use the word pilgrimages in this little passage that you know, that Putin makes pilgrimages. This is like a religion. It is detached from reality, but we have to understand that it's an article of faith, that no matter the level of personal sacrifice, that might today mean economic sacrifice. You can't go to McDonald's anymore. Your trips abroad aren't happening anymore. The ruble is, let's say, struggling in various ways right now. But if you watch your sons and brothers even die at the front, they're dying for a just cause. And this phrase, for a just cause, is a phrase that is often picked up on and used by Russian politicians. And Russians don't find it passing strange that allegedly the leader of this Nazi Ukrainian country is Jewish. They don't consider how crazy that sounds? Well, of course, the entire discourse around the war today is subjected to a number of contradictions. Most obviously the contradiction with reality. But the discourse today has been corrupted so that Russia is not being attacked just by Nazis and by the Nazi party, party led by Hitler. It's being attacked by a civilization, by the West, by liberals, by homosexuals, by queers, by Jews, anything that is considered non-Russian, and that's a flexible term that changes in meaning depending on what's most convenient to, 
the Kremlin and the Kremlin's propagandists, anything non-Russian needs to be destroyed. Anything non-Russian is a threat. And all of these things are synonymous. Being a liberal means being queer, means being degenerate, means being Jewish, means being Ukrainian. So logic goes out the window, and instead what we have is this amorphous bag of enemies. Okay, let's do a little virage here, because you've got another book coming out yes. in a few months' time. It's called Z Generation, Into the Heart of Russia's Fascist Youth. And it starts with a portrait of a 19-year-old named Alina. Why don't you give us a snapshot of who Alina is and why she is exemplary of Russia's fascist youth? So Alina is a 19-year-old that I dug out through social media networks. And Alina lives in Nizhny Tagil, which is a pretty godforsaken post-Soviet city, a thousand miles from Moscow. So this is not a member of the sort of cosmopolitan teenager youth that you might have heard about fleeing the war and going off to Kazakhstan, Georgia, or anywhere else that you can get hold of a plane ticket to. And at the beginning of the war, Alina, who is fairly well off as it happens and likes to go to Moscow, has been abroad many times, likes to travel, dreams of a big career in the tech industry, started to join these nationalist groups on VK, which is Russia's basically Facebook in terms of the way that it functions. And these groups spread some pretty dangerous ideas. The idea that Ukrainians need to be exterminated, Ukrainians need to be killed, that they're vermin, that they're diseased, that they represent an epidemic that is somehow infecting Russia itself. And so Alina began to like and share these posts on her VK page. And when I spoke to her, she told me all sorts of quite alarming things about what she believed, that she believed that in Nizhny Tagil, her hometown, they, she might like to conduct a genocide against Ukrainians and against homosexuals. She represents a politics whereby it's becoming normalized in Russian public discourse and normal for very ordinary teenagers who like Western culture and like Western movies. Alina's favorite is Game of Thrones. To also play at this double life and to be sharing and spreading this sort of language where they genuinely believe that the country is surrounded by traitors, by destroyers who are ready to seek Russia's annihilation. Who taught her to think this way? Certainly she learned it in schools. There is a growing patriotic education program in schools. We've seen in particular this year, of course, Alina has graduated school, she's now in university, but this year we've seen new programs to up the level, to accelerate the level of patriotic and ideological education. In popular culture, we see movies, TV shows that express this material constantly, whether it's trashy chat shows, whether it's political discussion shows, whether it's movies about the Second World War, which twist this genuinely heroic narrative of Stalingrad that we've been talking about into something that is deformed and dangerous and that is used to justify any level of violence. And as teens like Alina and her peers talk to each other in closed off VK groups and on networks like TikTok, they egg each other on to say more and more extreme things and create this some sense of snowballing hatred in little bubbles on Russian social media networks. And of course, that is entirely supported by the state. Let us share, again, another excerpt from This Now, your second book, coming out in May, uh, on your less than optimistic take about Russia's future. Can we get this quote up, please? One thing is for certain, you write, the quasi-religious concoction of nationalism, war, martyrdom, and rebirth being poured down the throats of Russia's young today will leave its mark. Everything tainted with the influence of the West, Democracy, homosexuality, difference, the non-Russian is suspicious. Everything Russian is praiseworthy. And everything Russian is under threat. Even when Putin is long gone, this Frankenstein identity toolkit will live on. Let's finish up with this. Uh, I want to ask you about Alexander Dugan, who was a guest on this program, actually, several years ago, a Russian conservative thinker, daughter recently killed in an assassination attempt on him, which went bad and ended up killing his daughter. He said on this program that Russians have a different anthropology, that as far as he is concerned, and here was his quote, to be human is the same as belonging to the whole. 
not to be a Western liberal individualist, so to speak. Do his ideas, in your view, have widespread uptake among Russian youth today? Well, Dugin's influence is in some ways overstated. He doesn't have direct access to the Kremlin. He never really has had a hotline to Putin or anything like that. He's certainly not Putin's brain, as he sometimes That's what they named. called him, yeah. But his influence is on a wider cultural level. Yes, he's a fringe thinker, but these ideas that he spreads around apocalypse, and he reads today's war as an apocalyptic war, a sort of final confrontation between this genuine society with real roots, religious roots, traditional roots, and a West that has become degenerate, depraved, dangerous. He sees that the war today is just the beginning of a conflict that is going to end up with total destruction and then rebirth. Once again, we see this sort of messianic Christian myth at play. Distorted, of course, there is nothing really religious about these ideas. And Dugin does appeal to a certain subset of Russian youth. There is a youth group associated with him, the Eurasian Youth Union, that has seen an uptick in membership over the last few months, as has the government-sponsored youth groups and a number of other sort of fringe youth groups. And so this material on social media spreads, drips through the culture and takes on a life of its own. It's very uncontrollable. It's a dangerous concoction. And the state would like to have complete control over it, but doesn't because social media enables those ideas to just spread like wildfire. In our last 30 seconds here, you live in Kingston now. Yes. Would you love to go back to Russia someday? I would love to go back, but sadly they have slapped me with personal sanctions and I am not allowed for the foreseeable future. What will it take for that to change? Events that I just don't ever see happening, or not in the next few years. It will take a wholesale move back towards liberalism and there is no sign that that is going to happen. Well, we're glad that this book has brought you to our studio today because it's been fascinating talking with you. Ian Garner, Stalingrad Lives, Stories of Combat and Survival. Thanks for the visit here at TVO today, Ian. Thank you for having me. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.